coming up on Digging Into the Future. When you go through what we call a SPAC off process, right, where you, if you're a management team and you and you have a high quality business that you want to speak to them, you know, we recommend you speak to a couple of SPACs, right? It's it's almost like, it's more like an M and A process than an IPO at this process at this stage in the state of the game, and you want to have those direct conversations, with three, four, five SPACs, and get them to engage with you and sign a letter of intent. Now, typically, because a SPAC is a very limited lifetime, right? It's 24 months. They don't have time to waste on deals that aren't going to happen. Today we've got uh, Chris Laskowski, the uh, the former head of corporate banking for uh, Citibank and uh, the head of corporate sponsor, former head of corporate sponsors, a 20 year veteran in the investment banking industry in uh, Hong Kong, and now a uh, entrepreneur out uh, doing his first SPAC. So uh, welcome to dig into the future. So SPACs, you know, obviously last three years, uh, personally, I went through. Uh, uh, I looked at SPACs uh, in my, my prior company. At that time, they were sort of, uh, it was seen as sort of like a pioneering way of doing things, but it now seems to have come full, you know, full circle to be in mainstream, right? I think you said there's something like 400 SPACs right now in the United States uh, looking to de-SPAC. So maybe one, explain to me first how you build a SPAC and then how do you de-SPAC? Those are the two things I think that most people are trying to understand. How does it work and how is that different from the traditional IPO that you'd go through? You know, the SPAC product, you know, has been very well received for a number of reasons o- over the last year. You know, first off, the quality of the SPAC sponsor has improved. So you've got very high quality management teams that have spun out to set up their own SPAC, as well as high quality sponsors. And then a hybrid model where you bring a sponsor together with, with, with a management team. You've also seen the breadth of the SPAC IPOs get broader and broader. It used to, frankly, be 20 or 30 hedge funds that were really the SPAC IPO investors. Now there's several hundred institutional investors and there's obviously a a growing uh, retail market. And then you've also seen the dynamic on the back end with the de-SPACs themselves. And some of this is seller awareness, right? So as people became more familiar with the de-SPAC process and people have seen that deals were getting done successfully. And last year deals were done very successfully. There was, you know, on average, probably the pop from de-SPAC IPOs was 30, 40% 30, 40% uh, for, 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 a, for a period of time. And that's largely because of several reasons. You know, number one, when you look at the advantages of a SPAC versus a traditional IPO, there's four or five key advantages in my mind. Um, you know, first and foremost, as a corporate issuer going to market, you'd rather have that direct dialogue with your, with your, uh, with your investors. So the SPAC lets you put out financial forecasts, and not just financial forecasts, you know, top line, bottom line, but also your strategy and what you're expecting to do over the next three, four, five years out. And so that lets you have that direct dialogue with investors, so investors know what to expect from you over a longer period of time. Number two, uh, your ability to get to market quickly. You know, traditional IPO, it's a six to nine month process if you're doing it right. Uh, In a SPAC, within two to three months of kind of going through the SPAC process, you've got a pretty good understanding of the valuation that you're gonna receive and your certainty of getting a deal done you know, at, at the end of the day. And then there's some other ancillary benefits of, of, doing, a, of doing a DSPAC. Structurally, it's a much easier product to work on. You can have earnouts, you can, you, know, you can sell shares, you can do primary as well as secondary. And some of this is quite relevant to Asia. Uh, you know, Asia as a marketplace uh, there's two primary reasons in Asia that you'd want to do a SPAC as opposed to the U.S. In Asia, there really isn't a secondary, uh, there isn't really the ability to do secondary share sales in an IPO. If you look at 95 of the last 100 IPOs that were done in Asia, they're all primary, pure primary. As soon as in an Asian IPO construct, you say you want to do uh, something other than primary shares and the management wants to sell, the founders wants to sell a little bit of shares, it all falls apart very quickly and your valuation suffers. But in a SPAC negotiation where you can sit down and have the one-on-one back and forth, you know, why are you looking to sell? You know, can I put some earnouts on you? Uh, can I structure this in the right way? It's a much more manageable deal to get done. And uh, under that construct, you know, SPAC deals uh, should are being much much well better received than than a regular way IPO. Yeah. So you're saying uh, it seems like the if you're a management team, it's a much easier way to get out. It's uh, it's obviously 
cost effective too, right? I mean, that's one of the things is you don't have to do the the long road show, which is uh, yeah, and you're not a, you're not dependent on someone else's sales force to actually sell your shares, right? Now you're essentially doing it yourself. I guess the big the big issue though is um, normally because the process, right? You have to your investors. You bring them the, the investment, and then they have a period of time where they can either take the investment or turn it down, right? And then you have to get someone to step into their shoes, right? Is that sort of how, – how do you manage around that? Because that's a little bit different than an IPO, right? No, no, it, it definitely is. So when you go through what we call a SPAC off process, right, where you, if you're a management team and you and you have a high-quality business that you want to speak to them, you know, we recommend you speak to a couple of specs, right? It's it's almost like, it's more like an M and A process than an IPO at this process at this stage at state of the game, and you want to have those direct conversations with three, four, five specs, and get them to engage with you and sign a letter of intent. Now, typically, because a spec has a very limited lifetime, right? It's twenty four months. They don't have time to waste on deals that aren't going to happen. So usually, what happens is once you find a spec that has an interest in working with you you very quickly get into a letter of intent with them, a non-binding letter of intent. But there's usually an exclusivity clause associated with that. So 30, 60 days out of exclusivity period. And at that point in time, what the SPAC is doing is two things. Number one, they're completing their due diligence on you, understanding what are they buying and, and refining their valuation views. Number two, they're also gonna go out and get what we call pipe investors, uh, public investors and private entities to go through and backstop that deal Right. So if you need, if you have a, let's say I have a three hundred million dollars spec and you have five hundred million dollars of capital you need, well, if my three hundred million dollars of spec comes along, and I'll I'll get to the vote in a second that you mentioned, but if they come along, I need two hundred million dollars of pipe investors to also get you the right amount of capital you need to get to get a deal completed, and and what that capital does is quite interesting. This is kind of validating capital, right? If you're going out to the largest institutional investors in the world, the Tomasics, the GICs, the Black Rocks, the the fidelities, et cetera, they will look to do that pipe for you. And what that does is that gives you certainty that you're going to be able to get your deal done. Because when you go to get that vote, and there's actually two votes, you know, that, that the SPAC investors will eventually see. First, they'll get a vote. Do they want the deal to go ahead or not? And then there's a separate in, independent vote. Do you want to keep your money in the deal or not? And if the SPAC sponsor has what they feel is a good deal, all the proper documentation set in place and good institutional investors backing up the deal with their own money. Usually the SPAC investors themselves, the back end investors, will go along with the deal and vote it through uh, for you to make sure you come to a successful conclusion. So you think SPAC's here to stay, but you think it's just one product uh, next to the IPO. So the traditional, uh, you know, you're a former banker too. Uh, and I know the, the fees, the fees on, uh, well, I guess the fees are probably similar between for a bank to do an IPO versus a SPAC, right? It's uh, financially, so it doesn't. It, they're sort of indifferent, right? I guess. Well, I think no. I think the fee construct is going to favor, from the issuer's perspective, it's going to favor doing a SPAC over an IPO. Um, you know, the six to seven percent kind of U.S. IPO fee is still relatively intact, yeah. and uh, in Asia, I don't think you're going to be paying anywhere near those levels to get a SPAC off the ground. Yeah. Um, at, at the at the end of the day, yeah. No, it seems like it's a great way for you know post VC money uh, tech companies to basically go public. I mean, it seems like it's uh, that's going to play. You're going to play a nice niche spot there. So, well, this has uh, been very very insightful from uh, Chris Laskowski, uh, former Citibank executive and and uh, uh, recently uh, anointed spacker, uh, <laughs> as we call him. So. Uh, Chris, thanks a lot for joining us here on uh, Digging Into the Future. It's been a great pleasure. Oh, thanks for having me, Bill.